All right, folks, good evening. This is the Monday Night Rule of Law Radio Traffic Show with your host, Eddie Craig. All right, tonight I'm going to try to do something short, sweet, and simple. I am going to talk about how to recuse or disqualify municipal court judges. If anybody needs disqualification or recusal, these people do. So how do we do that? Well, we go to the government code. There is a recently enacted portion there, subchapter A-1, recusal or disqualification of municipal judges. And it gives you a step-by-step process for doing exactly that. So what I'm going to try to do is go through this fairly quickly. And I'm going to show you the necessary process for getting these people recused and some of the reasons why we can do it. Okay. It starts in section 29.051, which is the definition. It says definitions in this chapter. One, active judge means a person who holds office as a district court judge or statutory county court judge. Presiding judge means the presiding judge of a municipal court, including a municipal court of record. Three, regional presiding judge means the presiding judge of the administrative judicial region appointed under section 74.005. All right. Now we go to section 29.052, motion for recusal or disqualification, subsection A. A party in a hearing or trial in a municipal court, including a municipal court of record, may file with the clerk of the court a motion stating grounds for the recusal or disqualification of the municipal judge. The grounds may include any disability of the judge to preside over the case, subsection B. A motion for the recusal or disqualification of a municipal judge must, one, be filed at least 10 days before the date of the hearing or trial, except as provided by subsection C. Two, be verified. And three, state with particularity the alleged grounds for recusal or disqualification of the judge based on subitem A personal knowledge that is supported by admissible evidence, or B, specifically stated grounds for belief of the allegations. C, or or subsection C, a motion for recusal or disqualification must be filed at the earliest practicable time before the beginning of the trial or other hearing if a judge is assigned to a case 10 or fewer days before the date set for a trial hearing. Now we're going to go to section 29.053. Notice a party filing a motion for recusal or disqualification under this subchapter shall serve on all other parties or their counsel, one, copies of the motion, and two, notice that the movement expects the motion to be presented to the judge three days after the filing of the motion unless the judge orders otherwise. Now we're going to stop there for just a second, and we're going to discuss a couple of these sections. Uh, Let's begin with the definitions. Okay, the active judge simply means exactly what it says, a district court judge or statutory county court judge, such as a county court at law. Okay, A presiding judge means the presiding judge of the municipal court, the one you want to disqualify or recuse. Regional presiding judge means the head administrative uh, judge of the judicial region that the municipality is located in. Okay. Now, the motion for recusal or disqualification, where it's talking about uh, what we must have, a motion must state and be filed within at least 10 days before the date of the hearing or trial. Now, normally you're not going to know ahead of time if they do what they did in my case, which is they did absolutely nothing prior to trial. They didn't do pre-trial. They didn't do a 15, 17. They didn't do anything. They went straight to trial. They didn't even have jurisdiction to set a trial date when they did because the complaint didn't exist. And until, uh, six days prior to my trial date. And even then the complaint was not accompanied by the mandatory information cited in 2.05 code of criminal procedure. 
Now, once we know these things are missing and we have the lack of notice issue because we've never been served with a copy of it, uh, like we have in the case of a young lady I'm helping in Rockdale who doesn't want me to refer to her as my girlfriend. But in any case, uh, we took it down there and filed the motion to dismiss because of lack of notice. Well, the judge conducted, as I said last week on the show, conducted an ex parte hearing and denied those motions, but never notified us that those motions had even been heard, much less denied. So when we got down there, we demanded that they review the motions. Well, he only looked through part of one and then said, I've already read these. I've already denied these. They're denied again. Just, just for the record, they're denied. But he would never tell us when he conducted the other hearing to dis, uh, to basically deny the motions in the first place. So what we're going to do now is we're going directly after this judge and this prosecutor on several grounds. And we're going to use this section uh, or this chap, subchapter of the government code to do that. And here's what the basis of this is going to be, where it says you must have personal knowledge that is supported by admissible evidence or specifically stated grounds for belief of the allegation. Now that right there is making it where, you know, you can, you don't have to know for certain why they should be disqualified. You can just make the assertion that, Hey, according to these rules, it would appear to be so, but we actually have criteria for both of these. A requires that you have admissible evidence. Well, guess what? We have the court record. The court record shows that the complaint was never served. The court record shows that the complaint probably did not even exist on the day they conducted this so-called pretrial. So the problem that's going to give them is they're acting without jurisdiction all over again. So that's one of the accusations we're going to make. The judge is acting entirely without jurisdiction, as is the prosecutor. Second grounds for dismissal, denial of due process through denial of notice. They violated 45.018B, which is a violation of due process. And the judge and the prosecutor conspired to make that happen. So we actually have two additional reasons right there. Failure to provide notice and conspiracy to commit that deprivation of rights between the two. On top of that, we can now assert official oppression, official misconduct. We can also assert that violation of the uh, rules of ethics and the code of judicial conduct. They are no longer being fair and impartial. They are no longer being ethical. They are simply trying to deprive you of your rights by judicial fiat. So, we're going to use this particular chapter, subchapter, to go directly after the judge and the prosecutor in my girlfriend's case. And we are going to make it in such a way where the administrative judge is not going to have any choice but to agree with us and disqualify this judge. And at the same time, if they appoint a new judge, then we're going to rehear our motions to dismiss for lack of notice because they can't unring that bell. Once they've deprived you of their right of the right of notice, they can't go back and fix it. Not unless you allow them to do it or you negate the violation by entering a plea to the merits, thus giving them jurisdiction and waiving the right to notice. That's exactly one of the reasons why we never ever enter a plea. By entering that plea, you are surrendering the last viable defense you have in these cases when you fail to properly set them up at the traffic stop as being not in transportation. If you produce a license, registration, insurance card, or any of the other stuff during the stop, you've negated the no transportation argument. Why? Because you gave them the accoutrements that suggest their idea of you acting in transportation is accurate. And guess what? They got all that on video when you presented it. They got it all on audio when you agreed to give it to them. 
So right there at the traffic stop, you hang yourself on the transportation issue. The moment you produce any of that documentation. Now, yes, I know if you don't produce it, they're going to arrest you. Well, guess what? You don't get into a prize fight with Tyson or Ali and expect to come away without getting hit plain and simple. But if you intend to get in there and fight to win the crown, then for a fight, it's going to be, you need to be prepared. You set it up where people know that you may be calling them because you've been arrested on instances like this. You have money ready in reserve for them to have on hand to come get you out in cases like this. So you spend as little time down there as possible, but you're not going to get away with not spending any, unless the officer decides to act with proper discretion. Now in my class, we teach every Sunday down at brave new books from two to five. I try to teach you how to force the officer to evaluate his choice and use the proper discretion and issue the citation rather than trying to take you into custody. But that's not going to always work, folks. You may as well bite that bullet now. It's not going to always work. These guys have an extremely high opinion of their authority and a very low mental capacity in which to evaluate. That's not true of all of them. There are some good ones out there. I've told you that, and I honestly believe that. I've encountered a few of them. I was one of them. Okay? But the majority of them do not fall into that category. They don't. They're hired to be armed goons. And that's how they will react most of the time. And you need to be prepared for and expect that. So talk to your friends, talk to your family, let them know what's going to be going on ahead of time. If you call them and say, Hey, I've been arrested because I was standing up for my rights. Tell them where to come get you and minimize the time you spend down there. At least that way you haven't waived any of the rights you need to fight this case later on. You do anything else and you will have waived rights you can't call back again. All right, we're fixing to take a break. We'll continue this on the other side. This is Rule of Law Radio. Call in number 512-646-1984. Give us a call, folks. We'll see you on the other side of the break here. We'll be right back. All right, folks, we are back. We're going to continue down through this a little ways now and talk a little bit more about this. So we're going to go now to the section on this notice. A party filing a motion for recusal or disqualification under this subchapter will serve on all other parties or their counsel copies of the motion. And we have to serve a separate notice that the movement expects the motion to be presented to the judge three days after the filing of the motion, unless the judge orders otherwise. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't make it clear what judge it's saying this notice has to be filed on. Do we file it with the active judge? Do we file it with the presiding judge or do we file it with the regional presiding judge? It doesn't say it just says notice will be giving given to the judge. Okay. And it's written ridiculous that the motion is to be presented to the judge three days after the filing of the motion. Why in the world would you give a judge that you're trying to dismiss through recusal or disqualification? Why would you give notice that says, hold this and wait three days before you serve it on that judge? unless the judge orders you to do otherwise. Well, here's the problem. If you don't serve it on the judge, how's the judge going to know it's there to tell you otherwise? Whatever legislative member wrote this needs their head examined because this makes no sense. Okay. It doesn't clearly identify what judge we're supposed to be dealing with here. So it's kind of up in the air. Who gets the notice under 29.053 sub item two? We don't know for sure. So 29.054 statement opposing or concurring with motion. 
a party may file with the clerk of the court a statement opposing or concurring with a motion for recusal or disqualification at any time before the motion is heard. Now, presumably, since this is saying a party, then that would be someone that is a party to the case. But party is not defined in this subchapter. So, you know, presumably we're limited to someone that's on either side of this particular case rather than some third party individual that has witnessed the events and knows a disqualification should be necessary. I would think that if it was actually allowing third party to do it, it would say a person could do it. Okay. So that being said, zero five, four is dealing with either of the two parties, whoever is on the side that didn't file the motion to recuse or disqualify 29.055 procedure, following filing of motion recusal or disqualification without motion. A, before further proceedings in a case in which a motion for the recusal or disqualification of a municipal judge has been filed, the judge shall, one, recuse or disqualify himself or herself, or two, request the regional presiding judge to assign a judge to hear the motion. Subsection B. A municipal judge who, with or without a motion, recuses or disqualifies himself or herself, one, shall enter an order of recusal or disqualification and, sub-item A, if the municipal judge is not the presiding judge, request the presiding judge to assign any other judge of the municipal court, including the presiding judge, to hear the case. B. If the municipal judge is the presiding judge, request regional presiding judge to assign another judge of the municipal court to hear the case. Or C, if the municipal judge serves in a municipality with only one municipal judge, request the regional presiding judge to assign a judge of another municipal court in the county to hear the case and to may not take other action in the case except that a judge who recuses himself or herself for good cause may take other action as stated in the order in which the action is taken. C. A municipal judge who does not recuse or disqualify himself or herself, one, shall forward in original form or certified copy an order of referral, the motion, and all opposing and concurring statements to the regional presiding judge, and two, may not take other action in the case during the time after the filing of the motion for recusal or disqualification and before a hearing on the motion, except for good cause stated in the order in which the action is taken. Now here, this pretty much sounds like as long as they put what they want to do in the order, they can go back and continue to do anything they want. Again, this order does not appear to limit what they can or cannot do at all. Okay. So here's the problem. (laughs) How do we ensure the judge does what he's supposed to do if he can continue to move forward by just writing what he wants to do in the order and having that carried out? What would be the point? Well, so far, they don't abide by any statute that's put in front of them. Why in heaven's name would they start with this one? Especially when it means they aren't supposed to be able to do anything. Or at least that's the way it's making it look. Now, let's look at 29.056, hearing on motion. Subsection A, a regional presiding judge who receives a request for the assignment of a judge to hear a motion to recuse or disqualify shall one immediately set a hearing before the regional presiding judge, an active judge, or a judge on the list of judges who are eligible to serve on assignment under section 74.055. Two, cause notice of the hearing to be given to all parties or their counsel, and three, make any other orders, including orders on interim or ancillary relief in the pending cause, 
as justice may require. Now let's talk about that last one right there for just a second. That means that that, uh, head administrative judge can actually issue an order to dismiss the case. If that is the ancillary in, sorry, dyslexia is a terrible disease. Please take these pills and cure it now. No, the interim or ancillary relief order that they can grant is to dismiss the case because of the due process violations that the court originally incurred by failing to provide notice and having jurisdiction. So the administrative judge can actually dismiss the case outright according to this statute. Okay. So we're going to write the motion up to do exactly that. Not only do we want judge a disqualified, but we want as the ancillary relief required by law, the administrative judge to dismiss the charges and the case because of the due process violations. Judge a tried to force us to accept. Thus, the whole reason we're disqualifying him in the first place. Also, head administrative judge, it does not help that the due process violations cannot be corrected by future actions. Once violated, they remain violated. They can't be fixed after the fact. The only fix would be waiver by the accused, and we're not about to waive it. Now, let's go to subsection B of 29.056. A judge who hears a motion for recusal or disqualification under subsection A may also hear any amended or supplemented motion for recusal or disqualification filed in the case. Subsection C. If none of the parties to an action object, a hearing under subsection A or B may be conducted by telephone. So again, do we want to make a road trip or do we want this to be held over the phone? Yeah, sure. We could do that. That's no skin off our nose. Saves us from having to travel all over the county to have it done or all over the state for that matter. So we can actually file the motion to recuse and request that the hearing be made by phone. And unless the prosecution objects to that, which I really don't see that happening, but if they do, then we'll both have to go to wherever it's going to be. Now, the problem here is, is if they're going to put it back in the same County, then they're putting the hardship on the accused to have the motion heard in the first place. And so far I have yet to have them conduct one of these hearings in front of either party, which this is saying they have to do. All right, folks, this is Rule of Law Radio. Call in number 512-646-1984. Give us a call. I'm going to keep going until we get somebody. We'll be right back after this break. So how the hell you get the presidency? That's what me All right, folks, we are back. This but is Rule of Law me. Radio. Okay, we're going to continue on with this here for a minute and well, figure out what else we can do to these bad boys when they won't well, obey well, the man. rules. All right, section 29.057, procedure following granting of motion, subsection A. If a motion for recusal or disqualification is granted after a hearing is conducted as provided by section 29.056, the judge who heard the motion shall enter an order of recusal or disqualification and one, if the judge who was the subject of the motion is not the presiding judge, Request that the presiding judge assign any other judge to the municipality, including the presiding judge, to hear the case. Two, if the judge who was the subject of the motion is the presiding judge, request the regional presiding judge to assign another judge of the municipality to hear the case. Or three, if the judge subject to recusal or disqualification is located in a municipality with only one municipal judge, request the regional presiding judge to assign a judge of another municipal court in the county to hear the case. Subsection B. If the presiding judge is unable to assign a judge of the municipality to hear a case when the municipal judge is recused or disqualified under section 29.055 or 29.056 because there are not any other municipal judges in the municipality or because all the municipal judges have been recused or disqualified or are otherwise unavailable to hear the case, The presiding judge shall request the regional presiding judge 
to first assign a municipal judge from another municipality in the county, or if necessary, assign a municipal judge from a municipality in an adjacent county to hear the case. C. If the regional presiding judge is unable to assign a judge to hear a case, when a municipal judge is recused or disqualified under section 29.055 or 056, because there are not any other municipal judges in the county or because all the municipal judges have been recused or disqualified or are otherwise unavailable to hear the case, the regional presiding judge may assign a municipal judge from a municipality in an adjacent county to hear the case. That pretty much sounds redundant with the last part of B. But then again, our legislators are not known for being the brightest bulb in the box. So look at the appeal 29.058 subsection A. After a municipal court of record has rendered a final judgment in a case, a party may appeal an order that denies a motion for recusal or disqualification as an abuse of the court's discretion. A party may not appeal an order that grants a motion for recusal or disqualification. Okay. Contempt. Now, I I love that part. We can appeal their denial of the disqualification. What it's not telling us is to who do we make that appeal? Okay. 29.059 contempt. If a party files a motion to recuse or disqualify under this subject, and it is determined by the judge hearing the motion at the hearing and on motion of the opposing party that the motion to recuse or disqualify is brought solely for the purpose of delay and without sufficient cause, the judge may, in the interest of justice, find the party filing the motion in contempt under section 21.002C. Now, here's their problem if they attempt to charge you with contempt by filing the motion to recuse or disqualify. You have the code of criminal procedure that says they were supposed to do very specific things. The things you're citing in the motion to recuse or disqualify says that they specifically did not do those things. So they're going to have a hard time charging you with contempt when you can show through the court record and through the statute that the required procedure was not being followed and that Failure resulted in a deprivation of a protected right to due process. So as long as you couch the issues correctly based upon that premise, that contempt section will never get invoked. Even if they try to invoke it, it will be a lost cause for them. Because you have the expectation that if the rules apply to you, then it must apply to them. If you have to abide by certain things, they have to abide by certain things. When they want a blanket shout out that, oh, we're not bound by any rules. Well, then this is no longer a fair and impartial trial. Can't possibly be fair and impartial because you're not even being informed as to what rules the game is being played by. How do you put up a defense against a case that has no rules about how it's presented and how it's conducted? And yet you are limited by whatever rule they want to attach to you through its proceedings, such as not getting your motions in on time. The fact that you didn't get them in on time, well, they're denied. The fact that they don't care that their side never got them in at all, well, that's irrelevant. See, not fair and impartial. Slight problem. Okay, we do have some callers on the board, or at least one. Uh, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take that caller, and then I'm going to spend a few minutes plugging our sponsors. All right, Jay in Texas, what can we do for you? Hey, Eddie, it's uh, it's the uh, no front license plate deal. I got the uh, my trial actually coming up here in a couple of days. I just wanted to go over a couple of things and make sure I was going to, you know, I had everything I needed. Okay. I have a I have a uh, motion to dismiss. Um, Fair to state uh, a cause upon which relief can be granted. Yeah, well, I have a lack of subject matter jurisdiction for uh, um, the incomplete. Uh, uh, the incomplete. Uh, 
been or no no complaint basically is what it is okay well there's actually several issues you need to file something in each one of them okay first off there is no offense listed in the section for not having a front plate in fact the offense was accidentally omitted by the legislature in the last session they can't charge you for a violation of a statute that does not contain an offense. Okay. If there is not an offense specifically spelled out in the statute, there's nothing to charge you with and they ought to know that. So you should be filing a motion to dismiss for failure to provide or failure to state a cause upon which relief can be granted. There's no offense in the statute for no license plate. Okay. Okay. Second one is no jurisdiction. There is no complaint and information filed in the court as required by law. The court was never vested with jurisdiction. Third, third motion to dismiss lack of notice. Notice was never provided properly, sufficiently and timely in compliance with 45.018 B 45.019 F 1.05 and 1.14 of the code of criminal procedure. I think I have one of those. I have the uh, lack of notice. That's that was the lack of subject matter jurisdiction one that I was talking about. No, lack of notice is lack of personal jurisdiction, not subject matter. Lack of standing because they haven't proven transportation. That's subject matter. Okay, it would be standing then. Yes, the prosecutor has failed to show standing on the record by showing that a regulable activity such as transportation was being engaged in at the time of the alleged offense. Okay. All right. I've tried to uh, get these motions in um, two or three times now, and they the first time the judge, it was just me and the judge and the prosecutor, they didn't want to, he didn't even want to hear him. He uh, told me to hold on to him, and then the did you file came, them? Just talk to them. Did you file them with the clerk? I tried to file them with the clerk, and I have her saying that you can give those to the judge that she didn't want them. Baloney! She's the one that has to file them. She's the custodian of records. Right, and I have the, I have that in. I have a recording of that. Okay, then you're going to uh, file another motion to disqualify and recuse because the judge and his clerk are preventing you from filing pleadings in your case. That's a disqualification right there. I would file a judicial conduct complaint against that judge, and then I'd file a criminal complaint against the clerk for acting like a judge. That all sounds good. I hope it goes well. Um, it's coming up in two days, so hopefully I can get all that paperwork ready. And I'll try to. I'll bring it in and uh, try to give it to the clerk again. See what happens. I'll get that and record. Yeah, tell her. Look, I'm here to file pleadings in this case. Either you take them, or I'm calling a cop to arrest you for blocking me from getting my due process. Right. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about that. All right. Thanks. All right, Jay, thanks for calling in. No problem. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, folks, this is Rule of Law Radio. Call in number 512-646-1984. This is your host for Mondays, Eddie Craig. Deborah is producing for us tonight. We will be right back on the other side of this break, so please hang in there and give us a call.